All right, I have introduced the sermon during the children's sermon time, so we're going to start right now into our Bible verses, and we're going to start out with John chapter 12, verse 1. Now, uh, I hope you make your way there. You can use your paper copy of the Bible, a pew Bible, your electronic Bible, but I want you to keep your Bible open because we're going to work through two different parts of this as we talk about steeple people from uh, John chapter 12. Here's what God's Word says. Six days before the Passover, Jesus, therefore, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, uh, Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. We talked about that last week when we talked about grief. We talked about the losses of life, how Jesus enters into those seasons to bring hope. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? That's the common wage for a working man at that time uh, per day was a denarii. And this is almost a year's salary. He said this not because he cared about the poor, John tells us, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he was the treasurer for the band of disciples. Because he was, the tr- he, he was in charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. As we enter this scene, we're in the last days of Jesus' life. And this chapter begins probably on a Tuesday. Jesus will be crucified on Friday of this same week. And there's a clear conspiracy at this point. The religious leaders are gathering up. They're forming their plans. They are going to destroy Jesus. You have the scene before you. Jesus is in the home. And you, you, take, you, you compare the gospel accounts parallels in the Gospels. They tell the same story sometimes, and you you, you get it from a different angle. In Mark's Gospel, Mark says they were in the home of Simon the leper. And that's one of my favorite descriptions of anybody's house that Jesus goes into. It's the home of Simon the leper. Now, you just have to figure that 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 name, that, that description probably didn't fit anymore. When he got to know Jesus, Simon's life uh, had probably changed considerably. And so, not sure why, he was still known as Simon the leper uh, by that disease. Maybe he just hadn't had time to change the sign on the mailbox yet. Maybe he was, uh, maybe he just kept it on his business card, Simon the leper. So people, Simon the leper, you don't have leprosy. And he'd say, well, there was a time in my life when I had no hope. Everything seemed lost. I had a disease for which there is no cure. And then I came to know Jesus. I met a man named Jesus. And he changed my life forever. And as we like to ask, you know, do you have a story like that? Do you have a story like that? Man, I have a story like that. It's a time in my life before I met Jesus. when there was a whole lot broken. When sin uh, was all that I knew. And I came to know Jesus and he forgave my sin. And I have a hope and a peace and I have a future because of him. You need a story. Everybody needs a story like that. As we compare the gospel accounts, we get more details about this. So you look at at Mark, you look at John, here's what we find. The guest list included Lazarus. And that's a great story. And we looked at it last week. So it says reclining at table also was Lazarus. And just throws that out in chapter 12. That's why it's good to read chapter 11 too. Because you say, okay, that's pretty cool. Because a few days earlier, he was dead. He'd been in the grave for four days. And now, he's hanging out with the rest of the family eating a meal. Because Jesus intersected their story. When Jesus intersects a story, everything starts changing. Lazarus has two sisters. Mary and Martha also lived in Bethany. Now, in John's gospel, it says here that Martha was serving them. That's Martha's always on her feet. And she's always taking care of everybody else's needs. She's serving them. 
which has led a lot of us to believe that, okay, Mark says they're at the home of Simon the leper. Martha is serving in the home. So Martha is probably married to Simon. And they're all dear friends of Jesus. And they love Lazarus so much. And life has been so different because they know Jesus. And they have such great joy that he lives again. And you have this warm, happy, thankful setting, unique and special with this storm cloud brewing just beyond. And I can imagine Mary, who loved to listen to Jesus, sit at his feet. She's there and she's thinking, after all Jesus has done for me, after all Jesus has done for my family, what can I do? Is there something that I could do in this moment that would, that would just show my love for him, would express how much Jesus means to me, to us? And then she came upon an idea. You know, the custom of the day, if you're a guest in a home, that the, the host would make sure your feet were washed because these are people walking barefoot or in sandals that they would pick up the filth of the world and it was just a way to, to honor a guest. And then they'd have some usually fairly inexpensive perfume. It was a scented oil and just a couple of drops, precious as it was even for the cheap stuff, a couple of drops and that was a way to honor uh, a guest in your home. But it was going to take more than tradition, more than customary, more than ordinary. If you love somebody with all your heart, don't you want to do something special? Don't you want to, husband, don't you want to do something special if you really love your wife? Say yes. You guys are all sunk. Man. Yeah, yes. Yes, extravagant, generous, overwhelming, because how much, when you love somebody, you want to do big. And then she remembered this vial of perfume. So the Bible tells it's a, it's a vial of pure nard. Now, that doesn't mean a lot to you, and it doesn't sound all that attractive. That's not like you, you go to the perfume counter at your favorite store, and you go, ooh, nard, I'm going to get some of that. Uh, th- this would have been imported from India And it would have been, as Judas notes in his criticism, of incredible value. Almost a year's wages. Uh, This this, this wasn't something like, oh yeah, I'm going to get that and I'm going to use it here and there like air freshener. Uh, A vial of pure nard, it was a way to store up wealth. It was like having stocks, bonds, a bar of gold. It it was a way to, 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 it, it was an investment. And she remembers she has it. And she goes and she gets it. And this isn't something where you just screw the top off and take a little bit. Uh, You have to break the neck of the container because it's sealed. And she pours out the whole thing. And it says in the, in the, the smell filled the house. It would have filled the house for weeks. It would have been everywhere. In, in, a, in a country, some of you have been in a third world environment where you just smell dirt, you smell animals, and you, you smell bodies, and it's... The smell covers everything, overwhelms. And we can talk about love, and we can talk about commitment, or we talk about love being extravagant. The extravagance wasn't lost to the people around them. This is one of the last positive scenes in Jesus' life. It's going to get ugly for the rest of the week. And in this scene... Uh, Jesus is still surrounded by complaining critics, and they go after Mary. In fact, one of Jesus' own disciples, Judas Iscariot, he attacks this act of extravagant love. She should have get, sold it and given the money to the poor. Now, here's what I have found, and some of you have had this experience. Anytime you do something extravagant for the Lord, with your time, with your talent, with your treasure... When you say, I love him so much, I'm going, to do something, I'm going to do something beyond ordinary. There's always somebody who's going to try to shoot you down. There's always, and sometimes a family member, oh, you need to be taking care of this before you do something like that at the church or for God or for kingdom work in the world. You, it's a friend, it's someone else. It's, there's always a critic when you do something big for God. And uh, that was true in her situation. It's true 
because the guy was Judas, protested immediately, complaining about the cost of the sacrifice. And John tells us they discovered later all the time as treasure for the disciples, little band of 12 plus Jesus, uh, he was making use, uh, dipping into the funds himself. Oh, you should have sold it and given to the poor. I've had people say that kind of stuff before. Oh, you shouldn't give to missions because we need to care about people at home. But I've never met any, and I'm only 50, almost 57 years old, but I've still never met anyone who said, oh, you should have, you, you should be doing something for the poor here in town who is actually giving anything to the poor in town themselves. But they're good to criticize everyone else for doing something big for God. You see how that works? It comes in a lot of different packages. Jesus said, Verse 8, you always have the poor with you, but you'll not always have me. Can you imagine if Mary had missed this opportunity? You ever overthink something? Well, I have. You overthink the plan and you say, oh man, I really want to do something. I, I, I want to I do the right thing. I, I, wanna, I, I need to go take care of it. I need to go visit this person, make this phone call. I need to give. I, I need to, there, there's something I need to do to express my love for the Lord and love for other people. And instead you say, oh, but I don't know if it's the right time. And I got so many other things to take care of. Maybe I'll just, maybe I'll do that next week. Can you imagine if she would said do that next week? It would have been too late. And she didn't hold back. And she didn't, didn't retreat from this prompting of the Spirit in her life. Now... When Jesus said, you will always have the poor with you, you will not always have me, does that mean? By the way, I was in a group of people when we were in Israel, not, not someone from our church, I'm grateful, but we're, there are people everywhere and there are tourists everywhere, and I heard someone saying something that was a beggar, and they said, well, boy, that's rough, but you know, Jesus said, you'll always have the poor with you, so that's not our thing. You think that's what Jesus meant? You don't have to care about the poor? No. Jesus cared for the poor. He ministered to the poor. He encouraged the poor. He threw himself into the lives of people who were poor. That's not what it means at all. What it means is there are things that, there are needs that are going to be there every day. And you need to be meeting everyday needs. However, sometimes there are unique opportunities that arise. Sometimes there are special, this is one shot at getting this right. And in those times, don't miss those times. That's the essence of Jesus uh, Meaning, you better do it now. People say, if you're going to do it, you better do it now. And we need to come to terms with that spiritually. There's certain things you're just going to miss out on if you don't take advantage when the opportunity presents itself. When it comes to generosity in our worship, in our love for the Lord, most of us are much more uh, guarded than generous. We're more sensible than, uh, than extravagant. We... We measure the cost, we calculate the percentage, and we don't respond to Jesus with this open, loving, sacrificial, extravagant kind of expression of love for Him. I read a story, uh, and Rhonda and I were invited to be a part of something with Compassion International back uh, in the fall, early fall last year, to go on a vision trip and see the work that Compassion does in uh, Peru one of the many places where they do incredible work, and, and it is an amazing work that they do. And so it was a group of pastors, church leaders, who were part of this vision tour. So I read this story, this testimonial. It was a, a businessman and an attorney. Also on that kind of vision tour, years ago, they were doing a, a tour of mission work uh, that their churches were involved in. And so they're seeing different parts of the world and different meeting missionaries, meeting, seeing the work on the ground to say, okay, this is what all these missions offerings are going for. And they were in Korea, and as they're going along, they pass, there's a field by the side of the road, and they have a missionary who's their guide, interpreter, and as they're going along the side of the road, they see this young, fairly young boy, and he is strapped to a plow, and this older man has this homemade plow, and he's guiding it through a rice paddy while the boy is primarily pulling the thing. And the lawyer said, well, isn't that something? Well, there's one of those cultural things you don't see every day. And as he pulls out his camera, you know, takes his picture. 
And I said, boy, that is really odd. And the missionary said, I can tell you the story because I know the older gentleman uh, and his family. And they're all part of the same family and they've been here for generations. He said, uh, there are enough believers in this area now that they, they wanted to build their own church. They've been meeting under trees and that kind of thing. So they wanted to build their own church. And that family, they, they wanted to give, but they're subsistence farmers. They didn't have any money. They, not like they could write a check. Not like they could hand you cash. They never had cash or money in their whole lives. The one possession they had of any value was an ox that pulled the plow. And so they, they sold the ox, gave the money to the church for that new building. And this spring, the, they're pulling the plow themselves. It's kind of humbling for those two uh, Americans uh, hearing that story. It's, wow, that's, that's a pretty big sacrifice. And the missionary said, interestingly, that's not how they saw it. They praised God that they had an ox to sell so they could be generous in building a church for their family and for their friends. Love for God that is real should be of all things extravagant. Not carefully measured and carefully maintained and closely guarded, but it should be extravagant because of the extravagant love Christ has shown to us. Now, one of the things I love about this story from Mark's gospel is what Jesus says about her. Jesus says, she has done what she could do. And that's just a great testimonial to me. Not, she's done what... Nicodemus could do or some other uh, she has done what John could do she did what she could do with what she had to honor her Lord and she didn't know Jesus was about to be crucified but she saw the opportunity to express her love and she grabbed it and what, what the Bible tells us is wherever this story is told anywhere what this woman did will be remembered and now here we are a couple thousand years later, and we're still remembering what Mary did for Jesus because she had an opportunity to do something extravagant. We're a steeple people. And we love Jesus. Worship is not sitting in a building. Worship is not singing a certain song or reading from a certain passage or doing a... Worship is your love for Jesus, and it's your whole life. It's not an hour on Sunday. It's your whole life offered up to the Savior. That's what worship is, and it ought to be generous and extravagant and big, and that steeple on top of this building just ought to be reminding us every time you drive by it, every time you see it from a distance, just say, we are focused on our Savior who loves us so very much, and we're going to find a way today to love Him back. Second passage. Verse 19, still John 12. And there's so much in this chapter. We could spend weeks and weeks in chapter 12. Verse 19, so, the fair, now this is after the triumphal entry. Now Jesus has entered Jerusalem. It has become a parade. There's all kinds of prophecy being fulfilled in every step Jesus takes. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, are completely undone. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Talking about Jesus. Then verse 20. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, one of my favorite sentences in the Bible, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Here's what I want you to know, steeple people. There are people looking for Jesus. We're going to call them seekers. People who are seeking after the Savior. Here's the thing. Seekers, you know what they want? They want to see Jesus. They don't want something less than Jesus. They want to see, and not just a, a cartoon version of Jesus, not that we've talked about over the last several weeks, an imaginary Jesus, the kind of, well, Jesus I believe in is like this. He's all scaled down and he likes me no matter what I do. And he's all mostly just working for me, not me working for him kind of thing. Not that imaginary Jesus, the real Jesus. 
The world's not looking for religion. It's not looking for a social club. It's not looking for a whole lot of new rules and regulations. It's not looking, well, I wish I could find some good people to hang out with. The world is looking for Jesus because God has wired that into us. And there's a point Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And if we'll really lift up the real Jesus, if we'll present the real Jesus, if we'll steeple people, point to Jesus, there are all kinds of eternal things that are going to start happening in the lives of the people we're encountering. People will be drawn to Jesus. These are Greek God fears, and they came looking for something for spiritually starved souls. So here they are. Who these people are? Greek God fears. And what that means is they have tried their Greek uh, mythology, their Greek philosophy, they've tried everything their culture offers to them, and it's spiritually dry. So now they said, maybe we try the, the God of Abraham and Moses and the prophets. Maybe we try that. Maybe we lean into that and see if there's something there. And you know what? They're still not finding what they need. They're still not finding something that touches eternity, that relieves them of their brokenness. So now we wish to see Jesus. In their search, and so far a fruitless search, they wanted to try Jesus and today, there's a spiritual famine in our world, and same thing. People are trying to fill it in all kinds of different ways. If you've been a part of gospel training around here, you know, a lot of people will, tr if I can make enough money, I'm going to be, I won't feel so broken anymore. If I can get enough education, if I can have, find the right relationships, if I can find a religious structure that just, uh, I don't know, gives me a lot of a a religious rules and regulations to live within, then everything's just going to be awesome. We... we, we we come up dry, spiritually dry, a spiritual drought all around us, and it doesn't satisfy. And at some point, we want everybody to have opportunity to hear about Jesus who died on the cross to pay for sin and was raised from the dead. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now, when it comes to that spiritual seeker, seekers are often not accepted by religious people. Uh, John, look, back in verse 19, the Pharisees said to one another, the world has gone after them. And what they mean by that is all the dumb people who are trying to look for something beyond religion. Because they were so tied to religion, so tied to just their rules and their regulations and their traditions and their structure. They'd completely lost touch with anything of a relationship to God. And when they thought about the world, they thought about all the dumb people who think that they, without all of our knowledge and background and well-studied experience, uh, they're going to find God. How ridiculous. But when John uses the word world, it refers to that mass of lost, lost humanity out there who needs a Savior. John always, for God so loved the world, all those people that Jesus died for, all the people that Jesus loved so much, uh, that's the world when John talks about it. And the Pharisees Oh, there's no way these people can figure this out. Now, all too often, we're not too far removed from the Pharisees because we say, well, yeah, there are all these people out there outside the walls of here today. But here's the thing about them. See, they, they need to conform to be like us. They need to look like us, dress like us. But see, they're not from our neighborhood. And they're, they, don't, they, don't act, they don't know how to act like church folk. And we put up a lot of barriers, just like the Pharisees were putting up a lot of barriers. Not our kind of people. We, we love to prejudge the spiritual soil. That's not the kind of person we're looking for at our church. Not the kind of person that Jesus is going to really love as much as he loves somebody like me. And, and we start putting up our barriers. Same thing today as then. But here's the thing. For these people... That Jesus came to seek and to save who were lost. People who were sick, who needed a physician. Jesus came for them. He came for common folks. And he came for outcasts. And when we get to be thinking we're too uh, spiritual and too uppity and too refined to interact with a lost world. And to reach out to a lost world we probably need to go and see Jesus ourselves because we've drifted a long way from that vision. Seekers do wish to see Jesus for themselves. I mean, they may not come to us. I've had the experience. 
I was sharing with someone uh, back in uh, the spring. And I'm going through a gospel presentation, and they just said, could you, like the Philippian jailer, what, what do I need to do to be saved? I mean, I, I appreciate all the background and all the detail, but just tell me how to get this fixed. What do I need to do to be saved? Sometimes it comes just like that. But regardless, when people come around, when you get into this conversation, they don't want to hear a lot about you as much as they want to hear about Jesus. Now, how had this group of Greek God-fearers heard about Jesus? Well, he's the talk of the town, for sure. That's at least one reason. He's stirring things up. The raising a guy from the dead will get you some, uh, some conversation going. But there may have been another reason. So we have verse 19 and 20. Between verses 19 and 20, there's at least a day that that passes. Some, some people believe maybe two days between those two verses. And something happened as we compare the other gospels between verse 19 and verse 20. Jesus cleansed the temple. Now, what that was is here's a Greek God fear, and they want to come and worship, but they're not allowed in the inner courts of the temple complex. They're, they're on the far outer court. And there were signs posted in the temple at the time that said, you can go this far, but this is as far as you can go under penalty of death. Gentiles are not allowed beyond this point. And so there's the court of the Gentiles in the temple complex. And you remember what was happening there? They turned it into a money-making scheme. There were money changers because there's temple tax you had to pay. And there are sacrificial animals that they're selling because whatever you brought from home is not going to be good enough. So we'll trade it out. We'll, we'll give you one of our animals. You can just trade in yours with a little cash uh, to go along with it. And then, oh, well, yeah, and then I'm going to sell your animal to the next guy in line. And then people were using it as a shortcut from one side of the city to the other the court of the Gentiles. So the one place where the Gentiles could worship is being trampled all over. And that's when Jesus says, enough of this. And he turns over the tables of money changers, drives the animals and the guys selling the animals out and says, you're not just passing through here with your baggage so you can get a shortcut through town. We're preserving this for the Gentiles who want to come and worship. So Jesus has shown he already cares about them. Even if it's from a distance, he cares about them. And they are interested in Jesus because of it. And they just got to know this guy better. So, we want to see Jesus. The seekers need to be guided to Jesus. How do you find your way when you don't know the way? How do you come to know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord? I think most of us seem to think if you've been around church for a while, that's just going to happen by accident. You're just going to stumble in one day. Well, you know, we're open for business every day from 9 to noon. If they want to hear about Jesus on a Sunday, we are open every Sunday. But it's going to take a little more than that. It's going to take a little encouragement. It's going to take some guidance. It's going to take a a testimony. It's going to take an invitation. It's going to take something beyond that. And not just waiting for someone else to tell them the way. We need to be intentional. We need to take responsibility for telling people where and how they can find Jesus. And again, if all that you see in Jesus is, there's benefit package for me. And so I'm going to come, and I'm going to enjoy the benefits, and I'm going to sit on my blessed assurance until Jesus comes again. That's really not what it means to have a relationship to Christ. There's a definition for what it means to be a Christ follower, and that does not fit in with the definition. And we have fallen so far short of God's plan when we short-circuit the the really adventure of the Christian life. We need to help seekers find the Savior. And, man, give them a Bible. Invite them to church. Pray for them. But you need to be equipped. I'm telling you, and we have more people equipped right now than ever in the history of this church of 100 and almost 40 years. More people equipped right now to tell people, here's how you can know Jesus. But everybody ought to be ready in an instant to tell that story and to encourage someone forward to know the Savior. Now here's Philip in this story. Philip is a Greek name, and these guys approach Philip probably because of his name. He, they had a connection point. Well, he, Philip, that's a Greek name. We're Greeks. Maybe that's the guy, that's our go-to guy. There may be something about you that just makes you the one person that somebody says, that's where I'm going. That's the person I need to talk to. Because whatever it is, the uniqueness of you that makes you their go-to to get to know Jesus. You need to be ready when they come. People are watching us all the time. And they want to know. 
does your faith in Christ work? I mean, they, they, they hear you talk about being at church. They know that you're a part of Christian faith. Do they see something in you that's real? Do they see something in you that's attractive toward Christ? Every step, every day is so important. And you have all those circles of influence, people you go to school with, students, people, your next door neighbors, people you work with, and they're all watching all the time. And you may be the only Jesus person they know. Are, are you thinking, this is my role today, and what would God do through my life today to give me the opportunity to encourage someone else toward the Christ? You know, Philip really wasn't sure what to, how to handle the situation, so what does he do? He goes to Andrew. What does Andrew do? Same thing Andrew seems to always do. He's always bringing people to Jesus. And so Andrew, he... He, he doesn't say, well, let me tell you, here's what you need to do. Here's some good rules to follow, and here's some good uh, ethical uh, demands that you might want to try to meet. He doesn't do that. Andrew and Philip, just take these guys to meet Jesus. Here's a story. It's a legendary pastor, R.G. Lee, pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. And he told this story and said he's been with the Lord for a long time now. Uh, But it's a great story. It's always uh, resonated with me, certainly as a pastor. Uh, R.G. Lee, 2 o'clock in the morning, he got a call at his house. And uh, it's from the hospital, nurse at the hospital. Said, we have a lady down here, and she's she's really sick. She's probably not going to make it through the night. And she's asking for you. He didn't recognize her name, but he he thought, oh, 2 o'clock in the morning. Tomorrow's going to be a really busy day, but she's dying. I'm going to go. And so he dressed, got in his car, drove to the hospital. Dr. Lee said he arrived, he walks into the room. The woman was not a member of his church. He'd never met her before. And he said, you know, I'm uh, R.G. Lee and heard you wanted to talk to me. And she, she was, and she's in a bad way. You could tell she's toward the end. She's still able to talk. And she said, Dr. Lee, I've heard you preach many a time. He said, well, I appreciate that. And he started talking. And she said, Dr. Lee, I've heard you preach many a time. And he said, well, he tried to talk again. Again, Dr. Lee, third time, I've heard you preach many a time. And she died right then. Dr. Lee, he said, he just, okay. No family around, no contact information. She seemed to be all on her own. And hospital said they'd take care of things. And he, you know, if you need me, let me know. And climbed back in his car, drove back to his house, undressed, got back into bed. But he said he couldn't sleep because he had to keep thinking. What did she hear me preach? Did I give her what she needed for the day she died? Somewhere in there? Had I, had, I, had I shared what she desperately had to have for this moment? Had I shared Jesus with her? We worship today, gathered up, and I'm so glad you're here. We come in this building Top by that steeple with a cross on top of it is a reminder that we are steeples as well in worship and in pointing other people to Jesus. And, in, and that's in this world that is so dark and so sinful. And what I want you to know from John chapter 12 is everybody needs Jesus. Now, I'm going to do this quickly. Uh, I I alluded to this in my Saturday email that we send out. Um, There's a lot of applications for this. But I want to give you specific applications a little different because people need Jesus in Allen, Texas. We had a team going out yesterday sharing specifically training and and specifically going going to Muslim households in our city. Because everybody needs Jesus. Great things took place yesterday. Uh, we're not holding back here in town. 
Uh, but around the world, oh, there's so many people who need Jesus. And uh, I have some dear friends in this church and beyond who've been a part of a ministry for a long time. And uh, this ministry is named for my predecessor here at First Baptist Church Allen, Dick Center. Dick served as the pastor here for 26 years. And then we had a, we had a year that we overlapped in transition. So 27 years he uh, faithfully served uh, this church. And then he moved down to San Antonio to be closer to family. And down, and down there, he continued to serve uh, Churchill Baptist Church. He died just over a year ago, went to be with the Lord. Uh, but he served almost right up until he died. And once he retired from here, he started a ministry, Dick Center Ministries, focused on missions around the world. And a big part of the application of that was with International Commission. Now, International Commission is the missions organization that most of the time, when I'm going somewhere with missions, I'm going with International Commission because their whole focus in going out is sharing the gospel in places uh, in kind of a saturation evangelism. And we have seen God doing great things. Many of you have been a part of International Commission's work around the world. But one of my favorite things that International Commission does and that Dick Center Ministries is focused on uh, through these years since... Uh, Brother Dick retired, and now the ministry continues on in his name, even though he's with the Lord, our national-to-national evangelism efforts. And here's what that is. If me and some of you gather up, and we go over to Kenya, and we're sharing the gospel, there's some Americans, and there are pastors from other parts of Africa, and we partner with local churches, and we share, share the gospel in the area of all those different local churches. That's an international crusade. National to national crusades are a little different. It's when some African pastors go and do that exact same thing in another part of Africa or South America or Asia. They're all over, but they're, they've been so productive in Africa. And I'll tell you why. I've been challenging you to pray James chapter 4, verse 8, which is a revival verse every day at 4.08 in the afternoon. And I hope you'll take that on because we need revival in our land. But here's what I want you to know. The greatest spiritual revival in the history of the world. More people are coming to Christ right now in the world than any time in Christian history. The greatest revival in the world. And I'm alive to see it. It's just not happening in my country. It's happening in parts of South America, it's happening in Asia, and it's happening in a dramatic way on the African continent. Now here's what national national crusades can do. There are a whole lot of places in Africa that I have been. So I've been 10 times into Africa myself, different parts of the country, sometimes kind of crazy places. But there are places I really can't go uh, because it would be too dangerous or I probably couldn't stay healthy. Just because of the situation I'd be stepping into. National and national crusades. Those pastors, they'll pay their own way on a bus. Four days, some of them. To get to these locations in other parts of Africa. And then they'll just pray that somehow there are funds to get them home again on a bus. And they can have something to eat. Although often they just end up fasting for the four days home. And you carry out that kind of evangelistic mission. Just like we do when Americans go. Except it's just... African to African. Here's the thing. They'll get into South Sudan. They'll go into heavily Islamic areas where I'd be too much of a lightning rod to show up with, because of my skin color. Because I'm an American. But they can get into those places. They can go places I can't go. And here's the thing. Most of those national to national efforts cost about $2,500 to fund top to bottom. 40 or 50 African pastors will go in, partner up with local churches, and share the gospel. There was, a, there was a round last year. Hal Camp sent this to me, and I appreciated it. There, there was a round last year. Three national and national crusades Dick Center Ministry sponsored. Over 50,000 people made commitments to Christ. And you start doing the math, and Hal said, you know, roughly on that one, you know, about 19 cents a head. 19 cents, someone who comes to know Christ. Uh, most of the time, it runs about a dollar, dollar 31 in Africa that you invest in one of these, and that's the payoff. 
Now, here's my challenge. Uh, I want to challenge you to give to support national to national crusades. Some of you could give the $2,500. Some of them are less money than that. And we'll pick out some of those African ones, and then we'll come back and give you a report. Because we get a report. Here are the people they dealt with. Here are testimonies from the effort. Here are the results of it. There was uh, one, one that is fairly recent, uh, Dick Center Ministries sponsored, 500-something people were baptized during the, during the effort, during the week. And uh, say about 30,000 people came to know Christ because the greatest revival in the history of the world is happening right now. I want you to invest in that. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have our regular offering in a while, but I want to encourage you. We're going to have, at the end of the service, as you're going out, Offering plates are going to be out there. Why don't you give? In that second offering, offering plates out, just write International Commission. Uh, or make, it, make the check out to First Baptist Church Allen. Cash is always fine. If you're giving, doing online giving, just note maybe IC, International Commission. The easiest way to designate so you don't have to write too much. IC. All of that will go to Dick Center Ministries so that we can fund a whole series of projects in Africa this year. And that's my challenge to you. Because we're steeple people.